Although we still don't understand all the chemical sequences that restrict movement and cause pain, a great contribution to our growing knowledge has been the life's work of Dr. Janet Travell. The patient is my student, and I'm the teacher. And if they don't understand what I said or follow through on it because they didn't understand it, then it's my fault and not their fault. And I mustn't be upset. I must just try again. The pinnacle of an outstanding career in medicine, the first woman to serve as physician to the President of the United States. There was another president who was also a patient, and there have been three more decades of research, writing, teaching, and patient care, the work of an extraordinary physician. I must honestly say that I never learned to become, even after going through medical school, I never really learned how to be a physician until I met Dr. Travell. She is the one who, who taught me how to relate to a patient, how to understand a patient as well as I know. Uh, maybe uh, the one person who might have her skills and been as good at uh, understanding and relating to patients uh, as Dr. Travell is, was uh, Osler. Janet Travell is a genius. And when I say genius, I mean she has created an entire field of medicine on her own, developed the science, developed the practical applications of it where there was no field before. She has understood things that people didn't understand before, codified them in a book so people could share them and understand them, taught them to disciples, and made it all work. She has filled a vacuum where people didn't even know there was a vacuum before in terms of medical knowledge. Dr. Travell's pioneering work in myofascial pain has focused increasing international scientific attention on what is now considered one of the major causes of pain and dysfunction. What we did was we looked at a population of patients that were coming to see um, their physician in a general medical clinic at UCLA. And what we wanted to know was how many of them were coming in with a complaint of pain that was myofascial in origin. And 30% of the patients that we saw were coming to see the doctor because they had pain. And 30% of those patients had pain that was of myofascial origin which is a really high prevalence of this particular disorder. Of particular interest, too, was that the primary physician that was taking care of these patients had not picked up this diagnosis in all but two. We compared how intense the pain was. We asked them all to fill out visual analog scales. And the myofascial pain patients rated their pain as severe as or more severe than patients who were coming in with pain of um, pharyngitis or... Um, angina or whatever. So the pain is actually a very severe pain and it ranks up there with any other pain that these patients will complain of. The examination of the individual with chronic pain uh, demands a laying on of hands because you cannot appreciate myofascial pain, you can't palpate trigger points unless you actually put your hands on the muscle and palpate. That's a very intimate contact with the, with the patient. And patients invariably tell me that, and they, they will often tell me that this is the first time they have been examined in any detail. I should the diagnosis of myofascial pain syndromes involves examining and treating patients with our hands. It involves Reach learning around, a new set of visual and tactile discriminations. These tapes cannot reproduce the feel of a taut muscle band or the precise spatial orientation of a specific muscle stretch. They can provide the visual perspectives essential to practitioners wishing to learn some of the basic techniques of myofascial pain diagnosis and treatment. The diagnosis of any myofascial pain syndrome is dependent on a knowledge of functional anatomy. It also requires a refining of history-taking skills and sometimes learning how to really examine a patient. The patient develops a great deal of confidence in the practitioner who knows how to examine and who can, who can find uh, the, the spot. When you find a trigger point and a taut band and you get a local twitch and you say to the patient, does this hurt? And the patient says, you have found the spot. And then you show some more interest and you say, does that, do you feel that pain elsewhere? And the patient says, yes, it travels right up my neck. And you say, is this the kind of pain that you've been having? And the patient said, how did you know? You have made a, a contact, and you've, got an, you've shown the patient you have an understanding, you have an interest, 
it, it is a real part of the art of being a physician. Uh, and I think that the examination becomes therapeutic in this sense. A precise diagnosis means effectively palpating and discriminating between trigger points in closely grouped muscles. Accurate assessment and effective treatment also demands the discipline of establishing a differential diagnosis. The assessment and treatment of people with myofascial pain syndromes is not an easily acquired skill. It takes time to learn. It will take more time to fully understand the basic science and clinical manifestations of these problems. Many of the most important research findings have been the results of Dr. Janet Travell's pioneering work. The main thing that we learned was that the trigger point was a physical sign. It's disclosed by physical examination. And if the shortened muscle that won't stretch is palpated in a neutral position, a, a taut band is felt in the muscle, a firm, ropey uh, group of fibers, or sometimes it's more like a button and knot. And when that is stimulated and pressed, Compressed is a tender spot in the band, and that tender spot is the trigger point. And if it's snapped transversely, there's a local twitch response of that band, which is an objective sign. An active trigger point is the trigger point that's causing the patient's pain complaint. And when you examine it, uh, many times, uh, you will find that as you snap the trigger point in the thought band, there will be a twitch response. And that twitch response guarantees that you do have a trigger point because we don't know of any other condition that will cause uh, a local twitch response except a trigger point. And this helps to confirm it, although the critical thing is that that trigger point reproduces the patient's pain complaint. That makes it an active trigger point. A latent trigger point is a trigger point that does not cause the patient a clinical problem of pain. They're not aware of having a pain complaint. Although many times when you compress a latent trigger point, you can elicit its referred pain pattern. It will reproduce the referred pain pattern, which is what would hurt if it became an active trigger point, it became more irritable. Here we see the baseline, quiet, no activity in the region of the taut band. Then we see the local twitch come into view with the qu quick uh, action potentials. And then a secondary response as the pressure is released from the trigger point, and then it returns back to a quiet baseline afterwards. The art of palpation is key to discovering the source of the patient's pain. Palpation should proceed gently through progressive tissue planes, allowing the examiner to discriminate between tenderness and muscle, other soft tissue, viscera and bone. The examiner's fingers and the patient's response become a physiological unit, a constant feedback loop, gently probing, evaluating, reassessing. Trigger points in muscle bands are most effectively assessed by either flat palpation with the fingertips or pincher palpation, picking up muscle fibers between the fingers and the thumb and carefully looking for trigger points. An overall assessment will enable the examiner to establish a phase for the patient's myofascial pain. Phase one of myofascial pain is constant pain all the time, and phase two is no pain at rest, but pain only on motion. These are active trigger points that cause this, that of more or less hyperexcitability. And phase three, <clears throat> we're dealing with latent trigger points. The patient has no clinical complaint of pain that would bring him or her to the doctor. And of course, Phase four would be no trigger points at all, neither latent nor active. Correct muscle identification is aided by determining the direction of the involved muscle fibers and by palpating the trigger point to elicit any associated pattern of referred pain or autonomic phenomena.
By combining this information with range of motion testing and other exams, an accurate anatomic diagnosis can be made. There is as yet no specific laboratory test or marker which identifies patients with myofascial pain syndromes. The diagnosis is clinical and is dependent upon a carefully taken history and a detailed physical examination. A complete and accurate history of the patient's pain can be given a more visual perspective by having the patient outline painful areas on a body form chart. The patient and practitioner can then review and refine the diagram. Range of motion and other pre- and post-treatment measurements can also be recorded on the body forms. Myofascial pain syndromes cannot be effectively evaluated or treated without obtaining the critically important history of perpetuating factors. It is essential to inquire about the presence of major systemic perpetuating factors. Nutritional inadequacies, metabolic and endocrine dysfunction, psychological factors, and infection are complex problems which frequently contribute to myofascial syndromes. Practitioners should consult the trigger point manuals and other sources for detailed information about these problems. Major mechanical factors also perpetuate myofascial pain syndromes. They include a short leg, a small hemipelvis, short upper arms, a long second metatarsal and ergonomic factors in the home and workplace.